Our next biotechnology lab is called Lab BT2, and it's a PGLO transformation. PGLO is the plasmid that we're going to use that contains the green fluorescent protein, and the DNA that we are going to be using and making a transformation is from a jellyfish. And we are going to insert that DNA into a bacteria, and we're going to produce a new genetically modified form of the bacteria that will glow green under UV light. So here's a video about what a transformation is or the different steps of a transformation. So basically, just in general, transformation is when you insert DNA from one organism into the DNA of another. A common technique in genetic engineering is to insert a new gene into a loop of bacterial DNA called a plasmid. The molecular tool used to cut DNA is a restriction enzyme such as ECOR1. The enzyme has a precise shape that allows it to run along the groove of the double helix, scanning in the case of ECOR1 for the base letter sequence GAATTC. The enzyme then cuts the plasmid at this specific point, allowing a new piece of DNA to be inserted. When it cuts, ECOR1 leaves a sticky end. This helps the new gene to attach. The joins are then stitched together by another enzyme called DNA ligase. The genetically engineered bacteria is grown in a culture medium. Very quickly, large numbers of the bacteria can be produced, each with a copy of the inserted gene. The bacteria duly manufacture whatever protein the gene codes for, and so the desired product is made. So what is transformation? Transformation is when DNA from one organism uptakes foreign DNA, so it takes in DNA from a different organism. And this DNA that is transferred into the new organism is often a piece of a circular plasmid. And a plasmid is a piece of bacterial DNA. And scientists have genetically modified this plasmid to in include DNA from the host organism, in our case, from the jellyfish. So this is a picture of a bacterial cell. And surrounding the picture of the bacterial cell, this yellow um, oval in the middle, are little circular pieces of DNA, and these are plasmids. So these are circular pieces of DNA from some sort of bacteria. And they are going, what we're going to do in our lab is we are going to make our E. coli bacteria take in these plasmids. But these plasmids are special. They're going to contain the DNA from the jellyfish. So a plasmid is used as a vector. So what a vector is is something that carries some sort of information or something. Um, for example, a mosquito is a vector for the West Nile virus, or, Lyme or ticks are vectors for Lyme disease. So the ticks and the mosquitoes are carriers that are carrying in a specific disease. Well, in this case, we're using plasmids as a vector. They're not carrying a disease, they're carrying DNA from our host organism. So our plasmid, again, is going to be a vector. It's going to carry DNA from our jellyfish. And plasmids need to have an origin of replication. And it's just a section of DNA that codes and allows our plasmid to make lots of copies of itself. The more plasmid we have, the more successful our lab will end up being. Now another section of our plasmid is going to contain a gene that causes resistance to an antibiotic. Now you might be thinking, why do we want to have an antibiotic present at all? Well, we only want our bacteria that's been transformed to survive and to grow. And there's going to be lots of bacteria that we're going to be working with, but we only want the ones that got the plasmid inside of them. So we are going to put our bacteria in an antibiotic solution. But our plasmid is going to contain beta-lactamase, and that causes our plasmid or our bacteria to actually be resistant to the antibiotic. So only the bacteria that got the plasmid in it will be resistant. So the only bacteria that we will grow 
will be our one that got the plasmid and it's going to be the one that will be able to glow green. And so this allows our transformed organism to survive. So this is a petri dish and that's what we grow bacteria on. We have two different types of bacteria shown here. So what we're doing is in our petri dish we are actually going to put in an antibiotic which is represented by this um, dark color. Now we still have both bacteria alive. It doesn't actually um, kill the bacteria but what it does is it prevents it from growing and reproducing and building colonies. But our green bacteria here, these are the ones that got the plasmid inside of them. They were the ones that were successful in the transformation. And they're going to start to produce beta-lactamase, which basically destroys and breaks down the ampicillin, which is our antibiotic. And so these green bacteria, the ones that got the plasmid inside of them, are going to be able to grow and reproduce. The red ones, the bacteria that did not get the plasmid inside of them, so these weren't successful, they are going to live out their lifespan, which is very, very short. They're going to die, and so we're only going to have our bacteria that we transformed growing. So again, the uptake of foreign DNA is what transformation is, and it needs to self-replicate, so that's what the origin is on the plasmid. We want to make lots of copies of the plasmid. We also want our plasmid to code for a protein that gives antibiotic resistance to the host organism. So it's going to produce the beta-lactamase, which will then destroy the ampicillin around our targeted bacteria and our bacteria that got the plasmid inside that was a successful transformation will be able to grow and survive. Now, there are two other things that need to go on the plasmid. We also have our green fluorescent protein, GFP. This is the section of DNA that comes from the jellyfish. And this is the gene that codes for our protein of interest, the green fluorescent protein. The last thing we're going to have on our plasmid is an on-off switch. And what this does is it controls the synthesis, the sy ah, I can't talk. It controls the synthesis of GFP. So it allows protein synthesis to occur. And it only works if there is a sugar present called a rabinose. So this is a plasmid. This is the plasmid that we are going to be putting into our reaction tubes with our E. coli bacteria. And we want this plasmid to enter into our E. coli bacteria and then our bacteria will grow hopefully and glow green. So what is P. -glo? PGLO is our plasmid, and it's a piece of the circular bacterial DNA, and it contains an extra gene from the jellyfish that codes for the GFP, the green fluorescent protein. So what happens as this cell is going through protein synthesis, it's going to produce GFP, the green fluorescent protein, but only in the presence of arabinose. So these teal boxes that just popped up, that's the sugar, arabinose. So GFP only will be made if arabinose is present. Now, after synthesis, after it makes the green fluorescent protein, because the arabinose, the sugar, is present, the GFP requires UV light in order to fluoresce. So it's not going to actually look green when you're looking at it under regular room lights or even in the sunlight you are going to need a UV light to be able to see it turn green. So there are different steps that are going to be taking place when we're doing the lab. And these are the steps of a bacterial transformation. This is how a genetically modified organism is created. So the first step is called competency. And this makes the bacteria cells competent or ready to receive the DNA. How we're going to do this is we're going to place our bacteria in calcium chloride. What the calcium chloride does is it weakens the pores in the cell wall of the bacteria. And it doesn't open them up completely, it just makes them a little bit weaker. Now you, rem you might remember calcium chloride was what you pipetted during your pipette test. So we're going to use those tubes in this lab. 
Then after you've weakened the pores, you're gonna rack. And what racking is, is you grab your reaction tube, and you grab a rack, and you basically kind of run your reaction tube through the rack, and it kind of bumps up and down in the holes of the rack, and that's gonna help kind of toss the things around and it's going to help break apart the cells so that the surface area of the cells are able to get more of the calcium chloride surrounding them to weaken the pores of all of the bacteria cells. Because when you pick up the bacteria, it's gonna be kind of in clumps. So the racking is gonna help break them apart. Then um, we're going to place our bacteria in the cold. So we're gonna put it in ice and that's gonna help prepare it for the next step. So step number two is the actual transformation. And this is where we're gonna insert the new PGLO DNA into the bacteria through those pores that have been weakened. So you're gonna finger flick. You're gonna hold your tube and you're gonna flick it with your finger and that's going to make the DNA that we've just pipetted in touch all of the bacteria cells. Then we're gonna do a process called a heat shock. You are going to take your tube that's on ice and you're gonna put it into warm water and it's for a very, very specific amount of time, so you need to follow your procedures carefully. If you do it for too long or too short, it's not gonna work. And what this does is it opens the pores suddenly and pulls the DNA in. It needs to be in the hot water for exactly 50 seconds. And this has been measured by scientists. If you do it longer or um, slower or less amount of time, the bacteria might not make it into the cell, or the Plasmin might not make it into the bacterial cell, or it might make it in, but then if it's too long, it might go back out. So the 50 second time is crucial. Then you're gonna put it back on cold. So it went from cold to hot, now back to cold. And that's gonna close the pores up again. And it's gonna hopefully keep some of that new DNA, some of those plasmids inside of the bacteria. The third step is growth, and this is our resting and feeding stage. After you complete the lab on the first day, you are going to add food. You're gonna add broth, it's called LB broth. So you're probably used to having like chicken broth and chicken noodle soup. Well, this is broth that's for the bacteria to eat and to survive, and it's called LB broth. You're gonna pipette 750 microliters, which is just enough food for overnight, if you have too little food, the bacteria won't be able to grow and reproduce. If you have too much, it could potentially kill the bacteria. They won't have enough room to be able to reproduce. And you're gonna keep it at 37 degrees. 37 degrees is just the perfect temperature for bacteria to grow and reproduce. Now, these E. coli bacteria originally come from our, our digestive system, and 37 degrees Celsius happens to be human body temperature. So that's the temperature that these bacteria like. Now step four is called isolation. This is where we're gonna separate the few transformed cells, the ones that got the plasmid actually inside of them successfully from the entire population. And this is where we're going to use the ampicillin, which is the antibiotic. So ampicillin inhibits or stops the growth of bacteria. It doesn't kill it, but it just prevents it from being able to reproduce. It breaks down the cell walls and the bacteria can't reproduce. So only amp-resistant bacteria will be able to reproduce. And our plasmid had the amp resistance in them. So that means that only the bacteria that got the plasmid are going to be able to reproduce and grow. And we might get something called satellite colonies, which form when the bacteria degrades the ampicillin around the cell, and it can then reproduce. So we might have little like satellite colonies surrounding our original colonies of bacteria. So we'll look for that on the last day when we observe our results. And step number five is expression. This is where we're gonna see the phenotype being expressed. And again, the phenotype we're looking for is the glowing green. And so arabinose is a sugar, and it's needed to allow the green fluorescent protein gene to transcribe, so go through protein synthesis, and make the green fluorescent protein. It's basically an on-off switch. If arabinose is there, it will glow green. If there's no arabinose, it's not gonna produce the green fluorescent protein. So the procedure. We're gonna take our colony, and we're gonna suspend it on the calcium chloride solution. We're gonna add p plasmid DNA to your positive tube, and no DNA to the negative tube. We're gonna add water to that. 
So when you're working in your pairs, one person's going to have the plus tube, one person's going to have the minus tube. The person with the plus tube adds PGLO, the person with the minus tube adds water. You're going to put bacteria in it, obviously. Then you're going to incubate it for 10 to 15 minutes on ice. You're going to heat shock for 50 seconds exactly. No more, no less. And then you're going to put it back on ice for two minutes. That's our heat shock. The hot, the cold, the hot, the cold. We're going to add LB broth, which is the recovery period. It's the food for the bacteria. Now we're going to plate our bacteria on different petri dishes. And in the petri dishes, there's going to be auger, which is a kind of jello-like solution. And the auger is where the bacteria are going to grow and reproduce. Um, and we'll be able to see them on the plate rather than in the reaction tube. And there's three different types. There's one, they all have LB broth or LB in the auger. So one's an LB plate, one has LB and ampicillin. So on that one, there's going to be less bacteria because only the bacteria that got the plasmid will grow in ampicillin. The third plate that you're going to put your bacteria on is going to have LB, ampicillin, and it's going to have arabinose. So think about which one is going to glow green of those three plates. You're going to make your predictions in a minute. When you put your bacteria on the plate, which we'll do on day two of the lab, you're going to pipette a drop of your bacterial solution into a corner of your petri dish. You're going to use something called a loop, and there's a picture of a bunch of loops up here, and you're going to barely touch. You don't want to poke or gouge, you're going to barely touch, and you're going to zigzag it through and kind of spread the bacteria. You're going to then do that in a second direction, and that's going to help spread it out a little more. So why the cold heat shock cold? That affects the membrane, so the cells can take in the plasmid. So here's our cell, um, our bacteria cell, the purple circles are the plasmid, and that's going to allow the plasmid to enter in. So why add LB broth? We want our bacteria to grow and we want them to start replicating the plasmid, we want them to make copies of the bacteria, and so they need food, just like we need food. So LB broth is the food for the bacteria. So what I want you to do now is turn to this page in your lab handout and I want you to make predictions of what you think is going to happen. So in plain LB auger, if you have the negative PGLO, which was bacteria and water, will we have growth? Yes or no? Will it, what color will it be in room light? So will the bacteria be white or will it be green? And what color will it be under UV light? You're then gonna do the same for PGLO and then for the other two types of plates, the LB auger and ampicillin, the LB auger, ampicillin and arabinose. So the answers for growth will be none, lots, a little bit, room is asking for what color in room light, will it be white or will it be green? And then under UV light, will it be white or will the bacteria be green? So go ahead and fill out your predictions in your lab report right now. And then we're gonna test your hypothesis. We're gonna do the lab.